Every year we choose a different subject that we think is about to become significant. Last year we did drone cameras and indeed we hit it right on time. And we think we've kind of done the same thing here with the avatars and the issue of virtual rights. So we're going to start, um, please, with Alan Lundell, who is coming here from California. And he is a journalist and a technology writer, expert, and videographer. And um, he's going to tell us a little bit, I think, about what's going on. Okay, this is uh, back in time. This is the beginning of virtual reality and that sort of thing in the 90s at a, a thing called Seagraph, which was uh, of the first trade show in America where they were experimenting with media and art. This is television in those days. It was part of his CD-ROM where it was just a little a postage size stamp in a larger image. Now it's a typical example. This is Walter Cronkite. Uh, I can tell you that I have covered science and technology now for 30 or 40 years, I guess, as uh, one of my uh, favorite subjects. And that included a series called 21st Century on CBS, which we shot about 25 years ago. And we did what was on the drawing room, the drawing boards then, of what we expected in the 21st century. And I can tell you that walking through the exhibits that you people have got here today, we didn't have the slightest damned idea. <laughs> this is so far beyond anything that anybody even dreamed of a quarter of a century ago. And it is so terribly exciting. As a dancer, you can interplay with uh, motion capture yes, and play with images. System. Yeah, this is 93. That's Zoe, who's uh, grown up to become a chocolatier, I might add. Now, this was early motion capture. Here's on a human body, and uh, presto, you have a three-dimensional character that does your work. This was a Biomuse device where you could virtually play musical instruments. In this case, a violin. Now you can imagine how far these have evolved from these videos of 23 years ago. What happens with new technology is that we copy the patterns of the old. It's like when we use typewriters or we went to word processors, they were like typewriters. Then it was the same with video. We started to think of uh, video editing in the same way as, as uh, cutting. But actually, uh, we have far more freedoms in video editing today than ever, ever before in visual storytelling. Now it's much closer to the way we think, uh, the way the mind works, uh, the way we tell stories of words. We can begin to wield pictures as fluidly, or at least that's the direction we're heading in. We are uh, developing technologies that allow us to use uh, both a combination of verbal and gesture language, gesture language, which perhaps the deaf community can contribute towards in define, redefining what we have classically called the cinematic language. The language itself is becoming uh, much more evolved. What do I mean by that? Well. Let's look at what everyone is beginning to do with uh, telling stories on your uh, supercomputer in your pocket. Uh, look at the formats that are coming out, starting with YouTube back in uh, 05. Uh, we've evolved from uh, basically taking um, the old structure of stories and putting them into the new medium. Now the new medium is redefining it. Now we have Vine with six second movies. Uh, and uh, you tell stories in six seconds and then pass that on. It's a, it's a different meme, it's still a visual meme, it's part of the cinematic language, but it's short form storytelling, very short, ultra short. It's, it's deconstructing media where, where essentially uh, media, uh, playing with media, I think is becoming as fundamental uh, as uh, reading, writing, and arithmetic uh, in our, uh, in our uh, school system. It's not in our schools, the kids are just learning it anyway. And it's very powerful, I mean, these, these things can, are giving supercomputers in everybody's pockets. What does that do to our species? You know, I think the latest predictions are that by 2020, um, at least five billion of the planet will have smartphones in their pockets. So, yeah, so what does it mean to have a supercomputer in your pocket that can tell stories? Supercomputer in your pockets that can tell stories. Well, what are the stories they're going to tell and who is going to be interested in those stories? As the medium evolves, so does the audience for the medium evolve. And Alan likes to talk about the, the development of this technology into the new human, the digital human. The big conversation in digital technology is, will, will artific is artificial intelligence meant to augment humans or is it meant to replace humans? 
And of course, one of them sounds really beneficial because, of course, augmenting humans means that we can help in situations where people are handicapped and they need to have, you know, the, the media help them see better or help them hear better or help them speak better, um, translate languages so people across different language barriers can understand each other. There's so many things that new media is going to do for us but um, we embrace it, just like when we embrace the automobile as a form of technology, it changed fundamentally what kind of humans we are. We're no longer the, the Olympian Greeks who will run 25 miles to carry a message to the next town. We are humans who get in our cars to go far distances that, on a regular basis that were inconceivable in the past. And so this is the relationship of technology and humanity. We invent things that change who we are, and that evolution creates a new world, and then we look at it, learn something new, and make sense of it. And that's where media takes us. Media is our message to ourselves about who we were in the past, who we are now, who we are in the future. It's our story. And the story is evolving towards a story that's more and more from the individual to their network of immediate, close familiars, not followers. That's still coming from the fan idea of fame. Familiars are the people who are interested in what each individual has to say. So it's kind of like your family and the people who know you and the circles in which you are the star. And the media itself will be something that's much more about sharing your personal story with the people who care what you have to say, because it's a many-to-many -many medium. Let me show you uh, something that I think is beyond a toy. Um, it's a fine phenomenon we've been covering for some kind, and you all have known in your own context, the whole drone phenomena, which you even covered last year at your show here. Well, you know, uh, the FAA passed regs to limit drones this year. How many of you are familiar with that? Yeah, okay. So you know that now the new legal limit is half a pound. Okay, now, now why did they decide on half a pound? You know, well, because everything mostly under half a pound is a toy. And, you know, it can't really carry anything too serious. But, you know, the, the interesting thing is that the maker community and the drone makers uh, took that to heart and they considered half a pound as, well, what's the most we can pack into something for half a pound uh, that can really do things, that can really race, for example. Racing uh, drones is a big, big hobby now all, all around the planet. And how can you race them? Uh, and so what they've come up with is, is a new micro miniaturization. This is the first model that, that anyone has seen of a full-fledged drone racer that is under half a pound. Here it is. And it has a camera. It has a battery. It's, it's got uh, cheap replaceable parts so that if you crash, which you do a lot when you're first learning how to fly drones, uh, it's easily repaired. And it's light enough so that it doesn't uh, bother you. Um, you know, it's, it's wonderful uh, in terms, I mean, bothering in the sense that, I don't know if, you, if you've ever been in a park and people are flying drones, some find it annoying. It's like buzzing angry insects, you know, in the park, not very nice. Uh, this improves that quite a bit. This sounds more like a, like a Jetson craft flying, you know, right out of the movies. It's really sweet. Uh, and in order to, to view it, this is actually the first implementation of virtual reality where you literally put on goggles like this and you see the live shot from this drone, live. And then you use your joystick like this, and off you go. You, know, you can explore uh, uh, the environment uh, like a bird, like you are like a bird. And for some reason, um, what, it, it awakens uh, whatever memories you might have of flying, be they from dream space or, or past lives or whatever your belief system allows you to experience uh, the uh, freedom of flying by being directly connected uh, is an example of extension of, the, of our senses. We're going, we're going beyond our bodies. We're able to move our consciousness to other arenas. I just wanted to, to say that the, this uh, drone technology is fast, cheap, and out of control. Everybody will be able to afford it. Um, and uh, it allows you to extend your will over a distance. 
it's way more powerful than a gun. On a gun, it basically allows you to focus a piece of metal at somebody, usually not for their well-being. <laughs> you know, it's a very particular intent, which is great, but this is an extension of your will intelligently. These things can deliver things, they can pick things up, they can, they can uh, be live eyes for your, for your own nervous system directly. You have remote, uh, remote view of Mars. You can have, yeah, the people who at JPL who, who move the Martian landers around have uh, incredible setup. They, they have 3D visual screens where they have the joystick and they're driving around. And when they come home to dinner at night, they feel like they have uh, been on Mars, <laughs> literally. Uh, so it's like that for all of us now. It's, as, I, as I said, it's, it's fast, cheap, and out of control technology. It opens up a whole new freedom of human consciousness that if we cut off too early, we'll not experience. It's a tremendous freedom that's far greater than guns because it's an extension of our consciousness over a distance and it can do anything that we want it to do or collectively want it to do. Anyway, that's, that's uh, the point I think in time we are with this stuff. And, uh, thanks for your attention.